Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. I'm Brigadier Retired Ian Lyles. I uh, served with the Royal Regiment Fusiliers for 36 years before resigning uh, three and a half years ago. I'm currently the Regimental Secretary of the Royal Regiment Fusiliers. Okay, just start off, where and when were you born? I was born in Stirling, Scotland in 1954. Okay, um, was any of your family in the army? Uh, my father was in the Parachute Regiment during the war and until 1947. Did this influence you to join? No. No. Um, you joined the Fusie as a regular soldier in 1973. How old were you? Um, 19. Did you get to know the soldiers quite quickly? Yes. Um, I joined the 1st Battalion in Londonderry, uh, in Northern Ireland in operations. And uh, when you're on operations, that's when the bond between soldiers is established very, very quickly and, and actually remains for the rest of your life. If you've been on operations with soldiers and officers, you will stay friendly with them and exchange stories and your lives have become inextricably linked. So do you still talk to the soldiers now that you've done operations with? I, I do, yeah. Um, so um, was the training hard? Um, back in 1973 the training was very, very hard, yeah. Um, the physical side was, um, the demands on the physical side were far greater than they are now, um, but I, I think you have to understand that in 1973 it was, it was the generation before um, uh, computers, before Game Boys, um, and young people spent their entire time outside running, um, playing football, playing rugby, and, and very few were locked in their bedrooms looking at computer screens. In fact, none were because there weren't any computer screens in 1973, unless you were a city banker, of course, and I think the mainframe would have been about the size of this building. So most, the vast majority of young men um, were outside running and were therefore had more natural fitness than perhaps the soldier of today does. So would you say you're fit enough to, for the training? Um, yes, because I played uh, a lot of football. All right. I played football at county level, so I was pretty fit anyway. So what was a typical day of training like? Typical day of training, goodness. Um, you'd get, wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, you would clean the barrack room, including the toilets. You would uh, make your bed in a, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that was called bed blocks, which entailed stripping the entire bed of sheets and blankets. And the blankets and sheets had to be folded in a regulation way and placed at the end of your bed. Your kit for the day, so let's just say you were doing that day PT, some range work and some swimming. Your kit for your day also had to be laid out on the bed. So your webbing would be laid out, helmet, um, your PT kit, your swimming trunk, your towel, everything had to be laid out. You then um, went to breakfast at about 7 o'clock and you would have a corporal come and inspect you, your kit and your room about quarter to eight. Once that had finished, the platoon commander would come in, have a quick look around the uh, accommodation, quick look at you, and then you'd start the day's training at about 8.15. And a typical day's training would involve all every day would be something physical, um, a run in the gymnasium, PT, You'd probably do some range work, some um, weapons lessons, I learning all the different weapon systems, so training you on the weapon systems, map reading, um, all the basic skills that an infantryman would need. You'd finish work at um, between five and six most, most nights if there wasn't night training on, and you'd then have to, have to clean all the kit you'd been involved in, um, tidy the block up a bit, ready for the next morning's inspection and go to bed exhausted at half nine. Right then, what, what would you say your favourite part of training was then? I think, um, I think my favourite part of training is the same as my favourite piece about being in the armed forces, that you're in a uni unique organisation that has a wonderful family feeling, you belong, you're respected, um, you have mates that you would die for and that's not replicated anywhere else in, in civilian life. Even in, I'd say even the police don't have that because they all go home at night. Um, as, as, as single soldiers, you, you live together, eat together, sleep together, do everything together. And, so, and as I said at the beginning, that's where this special bond comes in. And it, the bond is created by the regimental system. So would you say you looked after well then? I was given three square meals a day, but um, whether I was looked after well or not, I would probably have said no in training because you know, we were beasted a lot. Right. right. But not, not, not bullied, not, not no physical, but it was, it was hard. Um, the, the standards were hard. Right, you was to be raised as an officer class later in your career. Mm -hmm. What sort of qualities did you need? Um, 
I think you have to have a, uh, a basic um, education, uh, obviously, because as an officer you, you, you are doing a lot of planning, writing, um, uh, looking after your men, so you've got to have a good standard of education. That used to be a minimum of five O levels and two A levels. Um, now, ninety-five percent of, of, of officers and, uh, are graduates, and I think that's that's very very important. You've also got to have um, a, an understanding and be able to show uh, leadership, um, a little bit of management. It's more it's more leadership, but above all, absolute and total integrity. So, in nineteen seventy-six, you were commissioned. This, did this make your career easier? Well, having had previous service, uh, yes, um, yes, it, I, the training at Sandhurst um, compared to the training I did as a soldier, and then of course a couple of years in Londonderry, um, made Sandhurst very, so much easier for me because a lot of the people that were there had no military experience at all. Um, I was fit, strong. I'd commanded men as a lance corporal on operations, uh, so yeah, Sandhurst was very, very easy because of the previous service I'd had. What type of things did you do, at Sandhurst? Um, you did all the things that a trained soldier would do that I spoke about earlier, but you would also do um, lessons on leadership. And, and remember, Sandhurst doesn't train you to be a, an infantryman. Um, Sandhurst is training you and developing your leadership qualities. That's really the aim of Sandhurst. So you did a lot of work on leadership, a lot of work on tactics, a lot of work on um, the army and society. Uh, so it, 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 it was, uh, yes, you have to do the same as a trained soldier. Of course, you do. an officer must always be able to do what his soldiers do, do, do and hopefully better. But it was all the other things that go into being, being an officer. Um, the, the leadership, the deeper understanding, the ability to plan, um, the ability to understand where your, your role as a platoon fits into the company and the battalion and the brigade and the divisional plan. Um, it's, a, it's a much broader spectrum of training. OK, um, so... Before you done active service, you done some regimental duties. What duties did you do? Sorry, I don't, I don't understand that question. Uh, before you done active service, did you do any regimental duties? Uh, and what do you mean by regimental duties? Just like regimental duties. Such as? Uh, I don't know. Duties like to do with the country, I think. Like. I don't really understand what you mean. I mean. Are you asking what a soldier does when he's not on operations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the, 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 the bulk of what um, soldiers do when they're not actually on operations is trained to be on operations. So that uh, when you do go on them, there's, a, there's an old saying, train hard, fight easy. And uh, that's, that really sums it all up. The majority of what you do is training. That said, what else have I done when I haven't been on operations? Um, I was involved in a fireman strike, and as a platoon commander, I had two green goddesses and uh, put out, led my men to put out fires. Terrifying. Far more frightening than being in combat in Afghanistan. Um, I emptied dustbins when there was a dustman strike. I guarded prisons when there was a prison officer strike. Um, so this is, the, this is the other half of, of the armed forces. We are there to support the country when there are strikes, when there is disaster. Oh, sorry, yeah. In Northern Ireland, we had massive flooding, and we took assault boats out and rescued people from houses, old people from houses. And, and as I was just said earlier, that is the, the other part of the armed forces. It's not about fighting all the time. There are other duties we have to do, and, and they're called military aid to the civil power. And, and that's anything, as I said, from fighting fires to... Uh, guarding prisons to emptying dustbins. And more recently, when there was the threat of the fuel strike, um, the government turned to the armed forces. We need 2,000 um, trained drivers. It's called hazmat. If you're going to be carrying petrol or ammunition, it's ha hazardous material course. We need 2,000 of these people that have done these courses that can, if necessary, deliver fuel so that uh, you can get to school and your teachers can get to school. Okay? Yeah. Um, I think that really does that really answer your question? Yeah, that, that's that's fine. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, 1989, 1991. You was captain serving with the third brigade, brigade in Northern Ireland. Um, third battalion. Yeah. What did you experience? Um, we were sent out to um, Northern Ireland as part of a normal um, arms plot move. So in those days, m most of the army moved regularly, and it was our turn to go to Northern Ireland. Um, we went to Belfast. The IRA hunger strikers had been on hunger strike for about 
three months. I may be wrong on that, but it was about that. And um, there had been severe rioting, um, gun attacks, bomb attacks, policemen killed, soldiers killed. So we went into a pretty hostile environment. Um, then the first hunger striker died, and uh, we were literally um, preventing Belfast from becoming a burning inferno. Uh, and that lasted for about a year, until they all died, all the ones that were going to die, and we came off the streets after we'd restored normal or law and order. And this is perhaps a part, part that I should have answered in the last question. The army, and although it's very sad when they have to be used, if the police can no longer cope with the situation, then that's when the army go in to support the police. And that's what we were doing in Northern Ireland. Um, we weren't on army operations, we were there to support the police. So did you develop any sort of relationship with the people out there? Yeah, um, obviously with the policemen you work with, uh, that goes without saying. But that, again, with the people of Northern Ireland, um, the without going into the history and politics of it, the, the, the Catholic population was supposed to be our enemy, inverted commas, but actually 90% of the Catholic population in these areas we were patrolling were ordinary, decent people that didn't want trouble, didn't support the IRA, um, and just wanted to get on with their lives. And it was those people that really that, that you had to try and look after from the terrorists. And they had to give tacit support, otherwise the IRA would have kneecapped them or even killed them. So, did you feel sorry for any of the people out there? Yeah, I felt sorry for an, an enormous amount of people out there. In fact, both sides of the community, both Protestants and the Catholics, they, n neither community wanted their country to be involved in a 34-year conflict. And as I said earlier, the majority of Catholics um, didn't support what the IRA were doing. They, yeah, they supported a united Ireland, but not through violent means. But because they lived in the communities where the IRA lived, they had no choice but to give tac tacit support. Okay, so you left the Fusiliers. Why did you leave to join the Royal Irish? Um, <laughs> when you get to the, the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, um, they, the Army look at those uh, Lieutenant Colonels that are good enough to command battalions. And sometimes a regiment may have two colonels that so the Royal, in the case of the Royal Regiment Fusiliers, they did. They had two colonels that were of the right standard. Um, the other chap was selected to command one RF, and I was sent to command seven Royal Irish. Um, it's just the way it, it, it works out sometimes. But you know, once a Fusilier, always a Fusilier. So who did you prefer out of two regiments? I think that's a really unfair question. Um, both regiments were outstanding regiments, um, but I'm a Fusilier. Um, having said that, I commanded the, my Irish soldiers to the best of my ability and they were magnificent.